nice to be participating in this uh, very interesting uh, project started by our dear friends Dr. Narayan Prasad and his colleagues. Uh, see, basically, I am a geologist. I come from a small village in Western Ghats. Uh, have the privilege of uh, becoming the first postgraduate in the entire Grama. You know, India is made out of 250 Gramas or so. I was the first postgraduate. And uh, why I studied geology is also pretty interesting. When I went to college, when I opted to study geology, the lecturers or teachers were surprised that you can get either physics or mathematics. Why do you want to study geology? By then I had heard that if I secure good, good marks in BSc, I can get scholarship to study masters. Otherwise, I don't think my father was in a position to support. So I did well. I got scholarship and came out with first rank to the university. I got too many jobs in Hindustan Zinc, ONGC, State Mines and Geology Department. But then when I studied applied geology, two subjects attracted my attention a lot. One is photogeology. That is, uh, you know, how do you make sense out of aerial photographs? Another one was airborne geophysics. In that, there was one section on conducting aerial surveys for mineral exploration. So those two remained in my mind too much. But much, much hesitantly, I joined the State Mines and Geology Department. I was into groundwater. But uh, interestingly, I was also greatly attracted to working underground because I have worked 7,600 feet below the ground in Kolar gold mines for a month. So with all this uh, funny thing, uh, I worked for two weeks in the Mines and Geology Department, Karnataka. And the same time I had one offer with National Remote Sensing Agency that is advertisement number one bar 1975, the first advertisement where they wanted to recruit some research fellows for conducting airborne geophysical service. But I found the offer letter was from Kaveri Bhavan in Bangalore. I went and met the director who was sitting here, Wing Commander K.R. Rao. You know, because the contract said you can't publish anything, you can't reveal what you are doing. I said, then what kind of research fellow you are? I went and told, he said, this is a new organization going to have a great future. And we have five lakhs sanctioned by the government. Five lakhs was a big money for conducting aerial surveys for mineral exploration. And uh, 1972, uh, the McFar company in Canada had conducted some airborne surveys in different mineral belts of India under a project called Operation Hard Rock. They had junked those equipments in Safdarjung Airport and an aircraft which was modified for agricultural aviation, a DHC-2 D Havilland Beaver aircraft, three-seater, was also available. So uh, I found it's a very, very challenging offer. So just four guys, you know, joined. I was one of those four. Joined NRSA at its birth, okay? But then, you know, seeing an aircraft was a thrill and getting the aircraft ready was a thrill. And uh, my good colleagues were not familiar with uh, writing a letter to a foreigner because we had to write a letter. And, you know, an airmail letter I wrote to some contact in McFar company. One fine day he landed and fixed everything. Okay, hardly, hardly any aircraft. You know, other side we used to see Sanjay Gandhi and Dhirendra Brahmachari flying in Delhi Flying Club. And this side our beaver flying with some all funny uh, bird we used to call, you know, the sensor which keeps hanging and all. So slowly, slowly what happened is uh, nobody was ready to take up airborne navigation. I was asked, I, I got ready. I said, I, I am ready to f learn flying also. I am ready to do navigation also. So I came to Bangalore, took training in research flight facility at HAL in airborne navigation. I mean, uh, the Karnataka governor, Prabhashankar Dikshit's grandson was a bomber navigator, B-66 bomber navigator. He gave me some coaching. So I started navigation flying. 
So I flew 250 hours or nearly 25,000 line kilometers for mineral surveys in various mineralized belts over India. It was a difficult job, but uh, the odd thing was all for 400 rupees fixed. And uh, then I told Wing Commander Rao, I want to get out of this. He said, no, 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 you are doing a very crucial job. <laughs> so by the time what happened is we decided to wind up Delhi office. NRSA headquarters had come up in uh, Hyderabad. And when I came to Hyderabad, I got into regular aerial photo interpretation for geology and related aspects. And we also procured one 11 channel Bendix scanner. Before that, we had a borrowed uh, C-band radar, you know, Sir C from Canada. We had tried it out. So with Bendix came in uh, the Indo-FRG collaboration, uh, you know, uh, from Free University Berlin. The geologists came with them, we worked and all that. So that was a great thrill, but the significant part, what I feel we did is flying in Western Ghats for mapping thermal springs, a project for Geological Survey of India. Uh, that was too interesting. It had only one thermal channel, as uh, Dr. Narayan Prasad would know. But prior to that, we had a brief stint. These Russians had uh, given us one scanner, analog thermal scanner called Volcano, Volcano. So we had tried with that, but then, uh, you know, being analog, it didn't give good results. But working with uh, Bendix was a great experience. And working with, uh, you know, Professor List and his associates from Free University Berlin, it was marvelous. They used to participate in the field work also. Now, what happened is we found that the Bendix scanner was uh, uh, not all that adequate. We wanted to buy one Dedulus ATM, Dedulus Airborne Thematic Mapper, which had two middle infrared, two thermal infrared channels. Now, Professor Davan told, very good, you can buy, but then. <laughs> you have to make somebody fund. So marketing Dedulus ATM, you know, a, a, an airborne scanner technology was very difficult. We targeted two people. One was Dr. Hari Narayan, who was chairman of ONGC and was also director in GRI. Another one is uh, Dr. Tandon, you know, who was Coal India chairman. So that marketing job was left to me but fortunately, I spoke some good English those days because my father had taken extra care to tutor me with uh, Bhashantra Patmala and Rendan Martin grammar. So, so it was nice. Both of them agreed to fund the scanner. ISRO never wanted to pay for that. But they wanted to be treated as preferred users. So if they have a request, we have to honor. But... Uh, since this is an informal kind of session, what, what I enjoyed most after making presentation to Dr. Harinarayan is, he said, hey, Gide, I have listened to you. I have agreed to partially fund also. So you should treat me with a good dinner. So it was only me. So we went to one hotel in Hyderabad, Deccan Continental. He said, let's have grilled fish and beer. It was too good. Okay. So <laughs> we got Dedulus ATM. But uh, the most significant job we did with Dedulus ATM was uh, flying over the Jaria and Raniganj coal fields. Uh, basically, I am sharing the first hand experiences of mine where planning to execution to interpretation I was involved. Uh, Jaria Raniganj coal fields have a lot of, uh, you know, because of the high grade coking coal, there is underground uh, fire and the valuable coal resource gets burnt. So thermal sensing was the only way. So we flew over those areas and uh, we sensed the thermal hotspots. And uh, Coal India took the quenching operations. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the unique studies conducted in the world for mapping underground coal fires and quenching burning coal underground based on airborne uh, Service, airborne scanner service or thermal sensing. 
Now, by this time, uh, you know, about 10 years of my career, 75 to 85, 86 were over. But then by 1983, one of the most important things happened because, you know, you, we are all aware that uh, the ERTS-1, Earth Resources Technology Satellite or Landsat-1, went up in 1972 and NRSA was born for operational remote sensing in 1975, almost contemporary. So we were getting the analog data, 10 inch by 10 inch frame, you know, four blue, green, red and near infrared negatives. They have to be registered, made into a color composite. It was only 80 meter resolution data. So we were uh, comfortably using that. And Professor Dhawan felt it is the time we should have the consensus from all the development sectors in the country. That is National Natural Resources Management System. I don't know whether uh, uh, Professor Chandrasekhar mentioned about it. So we had a national seminar a unique event in Hyderabad where all the secretaries of developmental departments participated and we had conducted a good number of uh, pilot studies. They were presented to them. So it was unanimously agreed that a virtual system called National Natural Resources Management System would be launched in the country. Now what it meant is it is only a consensus by all the development departments under the chairmanship of Deputy Chairman Planning Commission, Government of India, where Planning Commission should make some funds available to all the sectors, you know, agriculture, rural development, all these kinds of sectors for using remote sensing for national development. And NNRMS will have an apex, you know, planning committee of NNRMS. It will have some standing committees for each sector and the member secretaries of standing committee will be some ISRO guy and chairman of standing committee will be secretary to government of India of concerned sector. Okay, we had about eight or nine and I had the good fortune of being member secretary to four of them. So a uh, lot of interaction with Delhi. So what we basically proposed, if I can summarize it a slightly uh, synthesized way basically suggest how remote sensing or satellite remote sensing can be used for developmental activities in a sector where approach would be clinical or based on clinical facts or symptomatic and arrive at or suggest some possible solutions but stay connected or stay addicted carry on so that went on for a long time, I mean long time. So uh, during the 85-86 time frame, as I said, I have tried uh, narrating the first 10 years of my life till now. Of course, in between I had uh, very interesting things. I had a UN fellowship in Adelaide, Australia, uh, where I studied interpreting airborne magnetic data. So uh, I, I must say that uh, those days uh, opportunities were plenty and they were uh, so good opportunities that they in a way tempted to switch over to the other side also. See, when I went to Australia, the offer was so open to stay back. So and so also at later stages, but somehow ISRO was also equally addictive, you know, uh, it was uh, very difficult for me to take a decision whether I should stick with ISRO or go back, things like that. So uh, then came when India, uh, you know, after that Bhaskara, Rohini, all those, when India wanted to embark on uh, regular operational remote sensing program, of course, as well as operational communication program, because by that time, as I told you, National Natural Resources Management System was there. Some communication ex experiments were made. So uh, it was time for India to get into the IRS program, Indian Remote Sensing Satellite Series. But prior to that, using aerial data, airborne scanner data, Landsat data, satellite remote sensing means so Landsat data. It was so household. So, uh, 
a program called IRS UP, IRS Utilization Program was launched in association with concerned state or central user ministries. So India being uh, basically a geological museum, because you find the oldest of the rock types, Archean II, the most recent. So all geological sequences are preserved in this subcontinent. So we picked up highest number of test sites, 12 test sites in 12 different geological terrains. That gave me an opportunity to traverse uh, length and breadth of India for ground truth, in the name of ground truth. A lot of time we used to spend in the field. So an interesting thing I want to uh, tell you, because when I was appearing for my D2E, DPC, Departmental Promotion Committee, Normally, you know, our mentors or bosses or deputy director level people would say, make a two page summary and circulate it to members. I made one map. I, I just made one India map. I just plotted all the project areas where I have worked, where I have traversed and where all I have conducted or I have flown for airborne geophysical surveys. I said, sir, this is enough. I made an index. He said, what is this funny thing? Nobody will understand. I said, sir, I will make them understand. I don't think there is any second person who has seen so much of India by foot. So I just went with it one drawing. Of course, it was merit promotion I got through. But uh, 1986 is a very interesting thing I wish to, I wish to mention because 86, 85, 86 were severe droughts in large part of India. You know, Maharashtra, Karnataka reeled under very, very bad drought. So 1986, uh, sometime beginning of summer, Professor Yuar Rao, the then chairman Isra, was called by the then minister for us, Mr. Shivraj Patil. See, do something to provide drinking water for villages in Maharashtra. I'll give you one month time. So suddenly we were all summoned, you know, few geologists from NRSA and SAC. Uh, we were summoned and uh, we said we will do it. See, what had happened is by that time for any geologist, what made sense from satellite imagery is marking something, lineaments, you know, linear features, lines and lines and lines and crisscrossing lines. Every time you see the image, you feel like adding some more lines. But very quickly, within a week's time, we sat through, we devised a methodology, because I was also at the core, called hydrogeomorphological approach. See, what is most visible from either aerial photo, of course, aerial photo becomes too, too much in detail. If you see slightly at coarser level, the most striking feature that you see on any space-based image is landforms, you know, the larger terrain features. So we thought we will map all the landforms in geomorphological term because landforms are evolved, carved due to weathering agents, water, after the crest is formed, right? So if you see the magma, then comes lithography, then comes further up, further up, the weather layer on that soil layer, then vegetation, then atmosphere. I mean, if you talk in sense of the broad sense of earth system science, the total thing is an integrated, it's a dynamic system. So map the landforms that is visible today, mostly hills, valleys, slopes, terrains and all that. And evaluate that landform for its groundwater content. So how do you do that? A landform you can describe in the form of what is the top cover, what is the soil type, what is the kind of runoff if precipitation happens because groundwater is nothing but the rainwater which has to go and stay and what could be the porosity permeability whether the area is suitable for dug well or dug come bore well or shallow dug well or deep tube well so we devised a methodology which is acceptable to everybody we embarked upon but then it was not possible for the state government people to make sense so we accompanied them we showed but when you go to field, there were big issues, you know. If the serpent of a particular village is from an upper caste, he will say the borewell has to be in, in front of my house because 
anybody and everybody can't touch that. But we had to convince them, look, this is out of government money, this is for everybody. So tens of thousands of bore wells were drilled in Maharashtra villages, which was followed by a similar approach for Karnataka. Now, this was a precursor. And uh, let me also tell you the funny thing. We were not able to go home and take bath also. Quite a few of us grew beard. Okay. So I also had no time to shave. 1986, when we were working day and night <laughs> for providing drinking water in the villages, I grew beard. After that, I never shaved. I retained it. Okay. So... <laughs> Then came, uh, you must have heard about the five technology missions which India had launched. Because Sam Pitroda was the advisor. And drinking water was also one of them. It, it was, you know, telecom, where C dot technology came, literacy, vaccination or immunization, then drinking water. So national drinking water mission was launched. And we had the approach, we had success rate, we had proven everything. So, uh, we took countrywide mapping. Then, subsequently, during uh, Bajpai's time, they wanted the groundwater recharge also to be ensured. So, identifying recharge structure. But then, we had to solve problems for arsenic contamination, fluoride, iron removal. So, all agencies came in and it was a great, great national moment. Because these are the kind of projects which made India a leader in remote sensing applications. So, uh, and uh, one of the key things under uh, NNRMS, National Natural Resource Management System, was also to ensure that all the states will set up their own remote sensing application centers. So, the first one was Uttar Pradesh. There was one professor, Chaturvedi, from Roorkee. Uh, and he, he struggled to establish the first one. There was no entry for anybody. So, the second one was Maharashtra. I tried going, but they said, you are a bit junior. So, a senior colleague of mine joined. The third was Andhra Pradesh. I applied again, Hegde, you make a very good candidate, but the problem is the notings in state government have to be in Telugu. You don't know Telugu, go on. Fourth was Karnataka. There were 12, 13 people. I applied, I got it because I could write Kannada. And uh, okay, I was fairly good enough. So 89 middle to 91 middle, I was the founder director of the Karnataka State Remote Sensing Center. And we did a lot of interesting projects, but one of the most significant projects we did again in one month is alignment of Bangalore Outer Ring Road. See, it was a 62 kilometer kind of ring road. In three stretches, they were not able to implement because wherever they try to align, people will make some huts and create record that that hut is there for several years. And uh, Bangalore Development Authority could never acquire that land. So, within one month, you should be able to tell what is there in the corridor and what is created overnight. And also, they wanted to give the broad alignment itself. So, in fact, uh, it was so interesting. I didn't know anything about highway alignment. So, I went to Tata Institute. And believe me, you're, you're all aware, internet was not there. Today, you can Google and find a lot of things. So I took one civil engineering book, how to, how to align road, you know. Okay, line of sight, you should be able to see as far as possible, it should be straight. And, uh, you know, ups and downs should be minimum, curves should be minimum, all such basic facts. So we did the alignment uh, for Bangalore Ring Road. I led the team and it was a highly satisfying project. And that time it was a trendsetter project in India. Uh, several newspapers, several local, national, all quoted that. And uh, BDA acquired. And there was a great uh, sidekick out of that. See, ISRO employees had made one housing society, about 100 acres and 1,000 sites. BDA was not clearing it because there were a lot of lacuna because ISRO people 
think that they know everything and they plan the layout the, the way they want. But he said, Hegde, why don't you help us? I said that goodwill I created by aligning the ring road was good enough for BDA to clear that whole site layout overnight. So, of course, these guys facilitated, felicitated me only with bokeh and all, but never gave me a free site, okay? So, that is all the uh, funny story. But then, uh, but what happened is, two, by two years, I was a bit tired in state government because work culture in state is very different. It is very slow. Uh, I must tell you one uh, very funny thing. See, I had some uh, optical equipments to analyze remote sensing data. I had set up the center in a dusty place. I wanted a vacuum cleaner, heavy duty. Now, heavy duty vacuum cleaner for a remote sensing lab, they never understood. The file went up and down. I mean, briefly, I have to mention the difficulties of working in Indian system. Then somebody told me, refer that matter to KGCC. Karnataka Government Computer Center, who are the ones to advise on how to maintain computer system equipments and all. He was a good friend of mine, director. I thought he will simply say yes and send it. Instead, he called and shouted at me, KGCC, Karnataka Government Computer Center is meant for guiding government departments to buy computers, not vacuum cleaners. Uh, see, but then... Uh, how will you break your head? I mean, these were certain odd things, so I got tired. I went back. I went and talked to Professor Rao. Sir, I want to get back. He said, okay, come back, he said. After my two years term was over, I went back to Hyderabad. Day after a week, I got a call. Hegde, I think you forgot what I told you. Sir, you had told me, come back. I told you to come back now, but you have gone back. Better come back. So once again, you know, shifting my son's school and oh, difficult, but uh, I came back. Now, coming back was significant because the Rio Earth Summit had just happened. And uh, Professor Ra wanted to initiate a program on sustainable development uh, of watersheds, okay? Watershed means, you know, a given area from where the water drains out of a single point. Because morphologically, watershed is considered as the smallest development unit for natural resources. Of course, which is anyway, it's not a valid approach today and uh, whatever it is. So, sustainable development we wanted to launch in all the critical districts of India. Nearly 175 districts out of uh, 600 districts of the country were taken up. And uh, I was also fortunate to be a thick part of making presentation to Dr. Pranab Mukherjee, who was uh, Deputy Chairman Planning Commission. And uh, we also had to convince the, the then Prime Minister, P.V. Narsimarao, because it was a unique project of its kind and we launched it. There again, same thing. We mapped all the different natural resources available uh, or natural resources as they stood in a given district or a given watershed and deduce locale specific action plans. Means in terms of this parcel of land requires soil conservation. This parcel of land is good enough for growing fodder. That patch of land is good for growing little agriculture, horticulture, or agro-horticulture, or agro, uh, uh, whatever, you know, multi-crop or whatever, depending on slope, uh, the water availability, the soil characteristics, the underlying weathered column, various things, okay, and also the consumption pattern. So, we integrated socio-economic data as well. You know, what is the livelihood of the people living in the watersheds and all that. But uh, subsequently, I once argued with Professor Rao, uh, this concept is not uh, correct because a watershed can never be made sustainable. He was not comfortable. Then I told him, 
that uh, you know there is lot of iron ore mining that goes on in kudremukh or western ghats of india it causes environmental degradation in western ghats of india but economic prosperity happens either in iran or japan right so today sustainability the moment you bring in socio economic aspects is tradable across continents also today in south india people eat wheat okay or uh, i mean uh, so it's sustainability is linked to many things today i mean uh, okay the gross productivity the consumption pattern the requirement i mean everything comes in okay so anyway that was a great project at that point of time uh and uh, when we took up various projects uh, subsequently i was also project director for one hilly district you know nilgiris nilgiris had a big issue you know it's a nice green district but then it is extremely important for slope based zonation of land use say 0 to 10 degree slope is good for uh, vegetable growing or horticulture in that area and say 10 to 30 degree it should be mixed but mostly it is steep plantation there about 30 degrees it should be necessarily forest but today i don't know you must have many of you must have gone to uti or wherever from valley till top you know they have gone for plantation through ages but the valleys will get affected by frostbite the middle slopes will go and lot of landslides lot of degradation so uh, we adopted something in line with the usda classification uh, united states department of agriculture classification for slope based zonation of land use it was a great success story i must mention with lot of pride because after that planning commission increased allocation to nilgiris district and also told such approach should be adopted to every hill district of the country and in the process nilgiris became the first district in the country to have their own remote sensing cell a district remote sensing cell uh so uh, i mean uh, another very uh, important thing i wish to recall is see when i was in karnataka karnataka government was giving uh, license to lot of polluting industries say distilleries you know mostly and who see molasses based distilleries who end up discharging a uh, lot of effluent with high biochemical oxygen demand bod content into the system now that is not only rich with lignin and caramel color but it is also a great pollutant you know with high bod content so i had told karnataka government the pollution control people satellite imagery helps you in understanding the groundwater regime in that area where you want to discharge effluent see you may discharge for irrigation it's a good manure but then it spoils the groundwater you know borewell water will come out with coca cola color so uh, we did a lot of projects to understand the possibility of pollution due to uh, this kind of effluent discharge and uh, subsequently it triggered grew into a huge project national river action plan yamuna river action plan ganga river action plan you know gap yap so we really scaled up scaled up scaled up to national level and uh, in you must be aware under the national river action plan of government of india what they did is along the river banks say whether it is ganga or yamuna or whatever all the polluting industries whether tanneries or other polluting industries which are those points where the pollutant enters the river so catch hold of them and make those industries treat you know na- national environment says and all we must have heard uh, it came out subsequently of course india took the help of uh, french government and all for yamuna river action plan but uh, i mean ganges indus 
Godavari, Krishna, almost all major rivers adopted this strategy. But then everything starts in a small way. Okay, we have to we have to start somewhere. Like uh, you know the urban infrastructure projects, which my other colleagues worked. I I am focusing on basically uh, what uh, uh, what I did directly. I was involved. Then. Uh, in the same uh, in the same time another uh, very interesting things you know because india is also a highly disaster prone country you know uh, i wish to mention about just a couple of projects one thing is when uh, when uh, the kosi uh, river uh, breach happened you know see it was a barrage which breached in nepal region so uh, suddenly the inflow into the son river basin kosi increased and uh, and we didn't know the cause okay so satellite image indicated that uh, there is probably a breach which is dangerous so they were not uh, uh, we approached uh, through ministry of external affairs uh, nepal government they they said no we won't give you permission to overfly our area uh, we had an airborne synthetic aperture radar c band but uh, they it's a, it's a big procedure you know we couldn't take so long and uh, i don't know if uh, you people have seen the uh, satellite picture of indo gangetic alluvial plain especially you know son kosi so gagra gandak kosi king kosi so on further up it is also tectonically active the area so one thing is the terrain is flat it is mature terrain in geological terms or geomorphological terms we call it as the terrain which has reached base level of erosion so a river cannot erode that terrain anymore then what happens river starts swinging now when the river starts swinging it would have meandered some of the meanders will be cut off some oxbow kind lakes will be formed and all that but if this kind of terrain is further triggered from underground neotectonic activity the rivers swing like pendulum okay so when a breach has happened upstream all the earlier streams which are not active today we call it as ephemeral streams will get flooded with water and just imagine about 500000 5 lakh people were to be evacuated but to understand the serious of the seriousness of the problem by the time i was director of the disaster management project in isro so we flew we flew with airborne radar c band radar because radar looks sideways no 42 degree off so we flew along the border but we looked at the other side in nepal we understood the breach is really serious then we acquired of course high resolution satellite images we understood the nature of breach but the beauty is mr lalu prasad yadav was the chief minister with great difficulty we convinced them matter is extremely serious you have to evacuate people from all these villages and they successfully evacuated where 5 lakh people would have been in trouble casualties or even uh, death of livestock was bare minimum and another interesting story of the kind is parichu lake have you heard about it i don't know see uh, it is a lake in the tibet region uh, occupied by china same thing one one uh, day suddenly the naftha jakri power plant which is down below in india the satluj basin they call that you know dirty water is entering the turbine we have to shut down the power plant we didn't know we took the satellite image you know irs wide field uh, sensor image wifs image as we call and we found that there is a small glacial lake which has burst you know due to landslide glacial lake had blocked actually a glacial lake was formed such lakes keep forming but that was breaching and suddenly you know naftha jakri power plant got 
dirty waters, muddy waters. Okay, that was in a way shut down. But then we had to monitor that and approach foreign ministry. They discussed with the counterparts in China. China said, you guys don't come. We will breach it in a controlled manner. So uh, we not only saved people down the line, we saved back Nafta Jakre power plant also. And uh, you see, I mean, uh, the, this is called, you know, the remote sensing based uh, diplomacy and which uh, did good for India. And the Chinese authorities, Chinese experts breached it in a controlled manner. So now routinely we monitor all the glacial lakes in the upstream. I mean, NRSC does it operationally. So, uh, I mean, a uh, uh, lot of uh, interesting things of this type. I, I would like to mention just two more anecdotes. As we moved down the line, because I was more into, more glued to applications, earth observation, and, uh, and which are more societal in nature. So we, we, by the time my colleagues had also, uh, I mean, they, they also did marvelous projects. One of the wonderful projects we did is the biodiversity characterization of uh, the entire, you know, Western Ghats, Eastern Ghats and island territory and Himalayan region, which of course my colleagues did. I was only coordinating because I was in headquarters. I was the deputy director in charge of applications in uh, the program office. And uh, you may be aware that uh, during uh, the earlier regime of NDA, when Prime Minister Bajpai was there, Mr. Murli Manar Joshi was the Minister for Science and Technology. They had started something called Jai Vigyan National Technology Mission. So under that, they had a special consideration for island territory also. I was working in uh, Andaman Nicobar Islands. Uh, basically uh, creating an information base, setting up a geospatial database and also see how best we can help the island people, Andaman Nicobar Islands, you know. So, uh, one Mr. N.N. Jha, Nagendra Nath Jha, a foreign service person, I think his last posting was ambassador in Sri Lanka. He was the lieutenant governor there. So when we were discussing and anybody goes from uh, mainland, you know, uh, I, I must also tell you, uh, when we went to Northeast, the chief engineer, we are having some discussion with chief engineer, he will immediately call, send the executive engineer, superintending engineer, some scientists from India have come in Manipur. <laughs> okay, <laughs> those who go from mainland are from India. <laughs> they, they are northeast. So, uh, Andaman was not so bad. So, Mr. Endenja told me a very interesting story. He said, uh, see, Mr. Hegde, we have only one referral hospital here. There are some doctors, but they are not specialists. We have an arrangement with Kolkata, uh, Kochi, and uh, and some two, three hospitals. Ah, Chennai, Sri Ramachandra. See, any, criti any patient of the island needing uh, critical health care, Andaman administration gives them one lakh. Now, only criteria is he has to have a ration card. He's really resident of islands. Now, he said, uh, see, there is only one flight per day and sometimes it is a stretcher patient. They say sitting patient and stretcher patient. That is the language they use. We have to remove eight seats in the aircraft and... Uh, Eight people will be offloaded and they don't know when they will be able to fly back. So, is there anything you guys can do? By the time I had heard of telemedicine, I said we will do telemedicine. Uh, very good, we will do telemedicine. So, uh, so we set up some telemedicine facilities. Basically, VSAT based low bitrate connectivity. We, wherein a specialist doctor could have video conferencing with the patient along with the local doctor or local healthcare worker and give some prescription. And medical records could be transmitted live across so that uh, that is available to the specialist doctor. I mean, a very simple way. 
So starting with uh, Andaman Nicobar Islands, which was uh, inaugurated by none other than the then Prime Minister of India, I, I must proudly say that it was my project. And subsequently, we scaled it up. We scaled it up so much that uh, at one point of time, we were the largest satellite-based telemedicine network in the world with about 370 nodes where about 60 super specialty hospitals, whether you say Tata Memorial, Cancer Research Hospital, or Fortis, or whatever, in all hospitals. And then we took it down to states, you know, Karnataka, Chhattisgarh, several states, you know, under the, the United Nations aided health system development project. Some states got big funds also. But everywhere we made sure that the respective chief ministers inaugurate. In Karnataka, SM Krishna inaugurated, Chhattisgarh, Ajit Jogi, like that, you know. It was a big fun again. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoy traveling, meeting these people, you know, whether politicians or bureaucrats, always sportive. Now, this uh, telemedicine subsequently what happened is the, the regular telephone line, BSNL, they also started so-called broadband. So when broadband connectivity came in, of course, we, we have been giving uh, satellite bandwidth uh, free of cost for uh, societal causes. Uh, uh, I mean, at the, at the apex, the best time, we had put about eight transponders of 36 megahertz each for societal use, on which the telemedicine, teleeducation, and village resource centers programs were running. I, I'll come to village resource centers. So uh, now telemedicine is continuing in, uh, say, uh, the border areas. Our defense uh, telemedicine network is the largest now, a lot of military hospitals, and they also extend healthcare. The military hospitals in border areas extend healthcare to the localites also there. Uh, they don't differentiate any poor fellow walking in the treat. So there, and uh, and Dr. Kalam wanted that uh, we help uh, Afghanistan, we help Africa with telemedicine. Uh, it all proliferated, but my different colleagues took care of it. And uh, another fallout of this is uh, when uh, the National Disaster Management Authority came in because of, uh, you know, Latur earthquake, the Kutch earthquake, and uh, I am sure that everyone is aware that uh, after the uh, Kobe earthquake, the Sendai framework, and almost concurrently was the uh, the New York Earth Summit, you know, Rio plus 10, Rio plus 20, Rio plus 10 probably, everything got aligned, you know, the, the sustainable development mooted by UN during the Rio summit further refined during the New York uh, convention got merged with the Sendai framework. And uh, at the international level, the sustainable development goals also engulfed the mainstreaming of the disaster risk reduction or mitigation. So with that, uh, India also, India has been extremely responsive so they started the National Disaster Management Authority with uh, General Wiz as the chairman. So we set up a separate database for them. And uh, we set up uh, several disaster control rooms, you know, the India Meteorological Department, Geological Survey, Central Water Commission, Central Water Commission for floods, Geological Survey for earthquake, landslide, and uh, somebody else for forest fire. I mean. All these uh, national control rooms, including PMO and Cabinet Secretariat, we connected with the state disaster control rooms, again, as a societal project where we gave satellite bandwidth free, we set up the facility free. And of course, as the time moved, they have done the right thing. They have switched over to either fiber, optical fiber, or other broadband means. And VSAT is also there as redundancy. Around this time, there was a great demand to reach out to villages with connectivity also. 
so we set up village resource centers you know we had uh, 470 plus village resource centers with we worked with 40 ngos 40 and we connected uh, we gave a connectivity to a lot of lot of uh, villages in 22 states and all the islands that was a unique project and uh, i mean therein i slowly got into the communication application side also uh, wherein uh, there were a lot of new technologies you know a, a wll or a small vsat working as a wi-fi hub along the wi-fi hub you can have hundreds of connectivities going down and a lot of mobile vans carrying knowledge as well as healthcare facilities to villages in fact uh, uh, we are all aware that even during this uh, recent corona pandemic, this technology worked very well. One of the most successful uh, stories comes from uh, Malaysia, where some Thaicom capacity was used to drop a local Wi-Fi hub and around which go and track all corona affected patients and uh, give them treatment or give them vaccine. And then and there, online you upload. So a beautiful, uh, I mean, these are all in the uh, public uh, domain today. Uh, I think I covered a lot of interesting things, but one or two, I also have really uh, some regret that, you know, one of, the, one of the great blueprints we had tried to make was, uh, you know, it was uh, during Prime Minister Bajpai's time, interlinking of rivers. You know, country had launched uh, on Golden Quadrilateral, North, South, East, West highways. And also there was a great project for interlinking of rivers so that the excess water, flood water, gets diverted to, you know, some other rivers. So that flood is avoided in certain regions and certain dry areas get water. And en route, lot of buried tanks and all will be desilted, filled and... It's a great project, but I, I wish someday India embarks on that. Uh, see, within the country, rivers could be nationalized because there are a lot of disputes, a controversial topic. I don't want to talk much, but then it was a great uh, visionary plan of government. But my take on the whole story was uh, to gain consensus how remote sensing could help I had the good opportunity of alone, single-handedly, making presentation to Manmohan Singh, who was opposition leader then, Pranam Mukherjee, and, uh, and you know, a lot of big leaders, and also to Dr. Kalam, who was the sitting president, and to all the industry tycoons like Tata, Sambanis, because that was in Taj Hotel in Mumbai. So, uh, really to gain consensus how effectively remote sensing can help in planning, implementation and monitoring. So, uh, I mean, I, okay, doing background work is one thing, but uh, to go and make presentation to all these people is different. So, that way, I was uh, fortunate. I think maybe I'll take uh, the last five minutes of my uh, interaction in this. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, uh, 10 years ago, I was uh, director for the Earth Observation Program, Disaster Management Support Program, and the lead for focused societal applications in 13 states and UTs in the country, all through regular official arrangements. And uh, with all these, uh, I also... Uh, got into little program management side more formally as scientific secretary ISRO, you know, who takes care of uh, overall program, budget, manpower, and a bit of administrative activities. And more than anything else, the main interface with Delhi on uh, parliament matters and all that. And in that position, I also had good opportunity of uh, uh, going to UN Office of Outer Space, UNOSA, you know, yearly twice as a delegation. And uh, I had the good fortune of uh, becoming uh, elected vice president, so elected vice president of International Astronautical Federation for two terms. And uh, 
I also had the good time of, uh, you know, one of the founder members of mooting the Sentinel Asia project, which was JAXA mooted, you know, sharing database for the Asia Pacific region. I mean, a lot of opportunities came my way. I mean, as a geologist, uh, definitely ISRO was indeed great. And ISRO is uh, working atmosphere in ISRO. Of course, of late it turned a bit bureaucratic. Uh, which uh, normally happens with uh, the organization aging, but still, ISRO has been really infectious as far as I'm concerned. But then I thought, uh, sometime before I call it a day, I must get into some executive position. So there was only one uh, very difficult option or position available because uh, the Entrix Corporation, ISRO's commercial arm, Okay, it had run through a little difficult time, but uh, there was an opening. I accepted to go as Chairman and Managing Director of Entrix in 2011, after all this stint, because from regular ISRO, I wanted to have a taste of being an executive. Though it is, it is ISRO's uh, commercial arm, but uh, it was uh, wonderful for me to get exposed to judiciary, legal system, coordinating and being tightly put about everything. Because in ISRO, we all speak hell of a lot. So <laughs> I got into a position where you have to be tight-lipped, but you have to market. But uh, it was, uh, I mean, uh, business-wise, it was a great time. You know, that is where I interacted with, uh, or Dr. Narayan Prasad was forthcoming, interacted quite a lot with us. Uh, but uh, we could have done better out of it because he was coming with a lot of technologies, miniaturized space systems, subsystems. But ISRO believed in only big satellites. Even today, we believe in something looking big. Uh, so what happened is uh, during my time in Entrex, uh, we were able to market the ocean color data to two European countries, two customers, UK as well as uh, uh, Euromap CAF in Germany. Uh, we could uh, market our C-band radar data to KSAT Norway. And the most satisfying thing has been uh, amidst difficult times, we could start one new vertical because there was a great demand for launching small satellites. So that vertical I started, see, today uh, during my time, I signed agreements with, uh, say, 21 countries, launched a little less than 100 satellites, but when I was CMD sitting there. But subsequently, I think uh, I had concluded contracts for about 250 satellites or so. Today, the score is nearly 350 satellites from 32 countries. And it is all, of course, all credit goes to PSLV, the versatility, but a uh, lot of changes have come in that segment because we used to patch wherever it is possible within the payload fairing volume. But today there are beautiful dispensers. You throw the dispenser out, rest is taken care. So uh, I think I, I left uh, my active life in ISRO with a great, great satisfaction that uh, Entrix amidst difficult times, I could take the company's revenue from 1,000 to 2,000 crores. We once again uh, branded or rebranded Entrix. See, if you are aware, at one point of time, Entrix was known globally for IRS ground stations, Indian remote sensing satellite ground stations, with we had done it with uh, a business partner, EOSAT of US. Then uh, we came out of that we, we came out of the exclusivity. We started marketing remote sensing data ourselves. But right now there is a depletion of uh, the space assets in that segment. But the launch service is going great guns. We still have a lot of active contracts. And, uh, uh, and uh, that's it. But of course, I could have stayed probably one more year, but then I thought enough. But uh, after my retirement, I continued another four years as advisor. And cumulatively, I ended up working 45 years and two months in ISRO. 
so uh, you if somebody says you know you had a long career in isro i always say i had long life in isro it's not career for me it's life so uh, i mean uh, i must say that as a geologist the kind of opportunities isro gave me are unbelievable and uh, life is tough of course see if you if you have to be if you have to be active if you have to be in limelight if you want an identity it is a, it is a lot of struggle but uh, it was worth it i had great time because okay going to be 70 soon but uh, living without any ailments and still i am able to recall a lot of things and speak i think credit goes to isro not to me good day thank you so much it has been great interaction